Hello everybody, I hope you're doing well today. You know, as you're watching this video, I hope you're at a place where you can look out the window and enjoy this beautiful sunny day that we're having. We've been having some great weather lately. I wanted to share with you a little bit today about what I perceive to be the continuity of the scriptures. You know, when I read the Old Testament and the New Testament, I'm kind of astonished at times about the continuity, the flow of things that happened in the Old Testament that have such relevance to what happened in the New Testament. But I wanted to share with you something out of 2 Kings chapter 24 today. You know, 2 Kings probably isn't one of those books of the Bible where we spend a lot of time. Some of us might read Genesis or Exodus, uh, the Psalms and Proverbs, but there probably aren't too many days when we sit down and say to ourselves, you know, I think I'm going to read 2 Kings. But in 2 Kings chapter 24, I wanted to look at something that happened that kind of made me just scratch my head a little bit and wonder, how does that happen? Um, in 2 Kings chapter 24, we're going to look at one of the kings in Israel's history. They had a variety of kings. Uh, many of them were bad. Some of them were good kings. But today we're going to look at one specific king. I wanted to begin by reading 2 Kings chapter 24, verses 8 and 9. This is what that passage says. Jehoiakim was 18 years old when he became king, and he reigned three months in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Nahushta, the daughter of Elnathan of Jerusalem, and he did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father had done. Well, that funny name, Jehoiakim, was a third generation evil king in Judah. His father and his grandfather is chronicled to be evil kings also. So he could have conceivably been an evil king for a very long period of time because he became king only when he was 18 years old. And in the next few verses, we get some insight into the kind of person, the kind of ruler, the kind of king that Jehoiakim was. This is what it says in the next verses, 2 Kings 24, verses 10 through 12. At that time, the servants of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up to Jerusalem, and the city was besieged. And Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, gave himself up to the king of Babylon, himself and his mother and his servants and his officials and his palace officials. Boy, when I read that, I had a question in my mind. And my question was this, why did Jehoiakim do what he did when Jerusalem was attacked? It's interesting. When you read that, what we see is that he surrendered he didn't just surrender, he gave up his mother, he gave up his servants, he gave up his officials. It looks as though he didn't try protecting his family even, or his servants by sending them away safely, maybe under cover of night. It doesn't appear as though he gave the Babylonians much of a fight like some of the other kings in Israel did. I guess he must have figured by surrendering his life might be spared. So I guess in that sense, then, we might say that Jehoiakim took a leap of faith. Now, our story continues in 2 Kings 24, verses 13 and 14, and this is what it says. And carried off all the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house, and cut in pieces all the vessels of gold in the temple of the Lord, which Solomon, the king of Israel, had made, as the Lord had foretold. He carried away all Jerusalem and all the officials and all the mighty men of valor, 10,000 captives. None remained except the poorest people in the land. So Nebuchadnezzar uh, has a battle against Jehoiakim, and it results really in the total destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, King Nebuchadnezzar's military comes into Jerusalem. They ransack the temple. They take away all the valuable instruments of worship. Most of them were made out of gold. 
They ransacked the palace that Solomon had built, and of those left from the battles that occurred, the Babylonians took 10,000 people away as captive back to Babylon. Now, we know some of those people. Some of those people included Daniel. And those three guys we hear stories about, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they would have all been included in those 10,000 captives that were taken back to Babylon. We're told in the next chapter that the Babylonian army comes into Jerusalem and uh, tears down its fortified walls and burns the city. In essence, there's nothing left of Jerusalem. You know, God had foretold to the Israelites that if they failed to be faithful to him, all of this would happen. And it did happen. Well, Jehoiakim and the captives of the Israelites live in Babylon prisons and they serve as slaves for decades in Babylon. And in 2 Kings chapter 25, verses 27 and 28, we pick up the story in progress. And this is what it says. And in the 37th year of the exile of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, in the 12th month, on the 27th day of the month, Aviel Merodach, the king of Babylon, in the year that he began to reign, graciously freed Jehoiakim, king of Judah, from prison. And he spoke kindly to him and gave him a seat above the seats of the kings who were with him in Babylon. I look at that and I shake my head because it seems like an impossibility. It doesn't seem like something that would ever happen. I think about how long Jehoiakim had been in prison. He had been in prison 37 years. He had been taken captive as the king of Judah when he was 18 years old. That makes him now 55 years old. And the king of Babylon, Aviel Merida, well, he was the son of Nebuchadnezzar. And what's really interesting about this is that Aviel Merodach ruled just one year, just one year. Historians tell us he ruled from 561 to 560 BC, but he does something extraordinary, something totally unexpected. He frees Jehoiakim in that one little window, that one narrow window of the one year that he reigned, Aviel Merodach frees Jehoiakim. Not only does he free him, but for some unknown reason, he promotes him to a place of authority in Babylon. Whoever saw that coming? And how do you explain that? Well, biblical commentators and historians are at a loss to explain what compelled Aviel Merodach to set Jehoiakim free. I don't know how you explain it, other than this, I believe it was all God's plan. God had foretold what would happen if the Israelites failed to remain faithful to him. The Babylonian destruction of Jerusalem, I believe that was God's plan. The carrying away of 10,000 captives, I believe that was God's plan. All that happened to Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel, I believe that was God's plan. Aviel Merodach coming to power for only one year? I believe that was God's plan. And Aviel Merodach freeing Jehoiakim after 37 years in prison? I believe that was God's plan also. Here's the thing, I think. If we have eyes to see and a heart to understand what's going on here in the Old Testament, we see in the life of Jehoiakim God's grace and God's mercy. The same grace and the same mercy that came to us, to you and to me, through Jesus. Especially when we read the next verses of 2 Kings chapter 25. This is what it says. So Jehoiakim put off his prison garments. And every day of his life, he dined regularly at the king's table. And for his allowance 
a regular allowance was given him by the king according to his daily needs as long as he lived. How do you explain that? Well, I believe this is a beautiful Old Testament picture of what God has done for us in Christ. Jehoiakim had inherited his proclivity for evil from his father and his grandfather. Just like all of us have inherited our proclivity to sin from our original father, Adam. Jehoiakim had spent most of his life in captivity. As people, we are all in spiritual captivity until Jesus sets us free. Jehoiakim exchanges his prison garments for kingly clothes. You and I, we also exchange our old self for a brand new self in Christ. Jehoiakim went from eating in the dungeon to eating at the king's table. And one day, you and I will dine at the marriage supper of the Lamb with Jesus and his kingdom. Jehoiakim went from having nothing to being given everything he needed every day by Aviel Merodach. Similarly, we've been given everything we need every day by Jesus, our daily bread. You know, the Apostle Paul captures the amazing grace and mercy of God toward us in Jesus. It's found in Ephesians chapter 2 verses 4 through 9. I'd like to read that for you. This is what Paul wrote. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved and raised up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast amazing grace, freely given to us, only for reasons that God knows. We don't know why he chooses grace, but it emanates from his great love for us. New life, freed from death, freed from separation from God and freed from our sins, promised to be raised up and seated with Christ in the heavenly places, all God's immeasurable riches of grace and kindness toward us. Nothing we deserved, just like Jehoiakim, didn't deserve freedom in the new life that Aviel Merodach had given him. All of it, everything is a gift from our great king. Grace, mercy, his unfailing love. You know, when I read these stories in the Old Testament, I think to myself, it kind of makes the Old Testament worth reading. Sometimes we just want to read the New Testament, but when I look at the Old Testament, it's just as full of God's grace, mercy, and love. So today, that's what I'm hoping for you, praying for you, and I hope you experience God's grace, mercy, and love in your life. Until the next time, God bless you all.